So welcome, letting Agile emerge. It's kind of a theme that um, has come up a lot lately for me is, is about sort of letting a solution sort of come to you. Try, try a bunch of different things and, and see what sticks. And so um, sort of coming to how my company approaches Agile, we've sort of let that emerge over the years over sort of trying a bunch of different things. And that's kind of um, the approach I'll talk through after I get through some of the more, um, I don't know, educational type material that I have up first. So first of all, I am Chris Wells. I work at Redfin Solutions. I'm one of the principals there. Um, we've been doing Drupal since 2005. Drupal 4.7 was our first site for a, a center at Harvard. And we never looked back. You know, we, we started by building a custom CMS. After about two websites, we threw that idea right out the window and uh, looked to see what was out there, picked Drupal, and have just sort of been there forever. I forgot to do like an intro slide for myself, but if you are interested in connecting up with me, Mastodon is probably the best way these days. I'm on Drupal.community as at Chris from Redfin, and I'm sort of Chris from Redfin on, on all the things if you want to find me. So. This is kind of like, I'm realizing we're, we're past 20 years of when the Agile Manifesto was actually released. Um, and and as, I, as I get a little older, I think about how that's really not that long ago, considering how long people have been managing projects in the world. So yeah, I think it was about 2001 when we got the Agile Manifesto. Anyone know what movie this is? Austin Furious. Oh, uh, that's a good thought. It's from Packers, which is older than the Agile Manifesto. That's what I'll say. I, I was in high school and I saw that one, so it's good. But this, this guy is like, he really does not like the word manifesto. He's trying to imply something, but his, his other guy, he's like your standard cop type, but the other guy's like in cyber crimes, and he's like, that's cool, man. He's like, that's cool? That's not cool. Anyway. So let's go back. Let's talk about Agile and what it is and where it came from. There are four values of Agile. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So Agile, saying that we're Agile, saying that we embrace Agile is about putting the people first, which is easy to forget. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Kind of wild, but makes sense. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Very difficult to do, I find, in, in our line of work, because we've got to have a contract. And responding to change over following a plan. This all sounds really great, but I have found that putting a lot of this into action is, is really quite difficult. So. This came out, the Agile Manifesto came about because a bunch of people who had been doing waterfall style software projects over time found that it wasn't working. And they found stuff that did work and then they sort of came together in Colorado to kind of discuss, well, what's working for you? And what's working for you over here? And they kind of said, well, the things that are working sort of apply to these four values. So these are the four values that then dictate the 12 principles of Agile. So you can say that you are agile if you are doing these things. Uh, continuous software delivery, which then brings customer satisfaction. If you accommodate changing requirements, if you do frequent delivery and collaboration, if you support, trust, and motivate all of the people that are involved. This is a really interesting one. Enable face-to-face -face interactions a little bit harder in this world. But the primary measure of progress is working software. And again, a little bit more difficult for people who maybe are building websites, not necessarily working software. The development pace needs to be consistent and sustainable. Uh, attention to technical detail and design enhances agility. Simplicity, which is like just a bold word, there's nothing else to it. <laughs> the most simple of the principles, but when we talk about like the MVP, the minimum viable product, we're talking about that tenant, that simplicity. They encourage self-organization among the teams and regular reflections, or what we would call retrospectives a lot of times. So 
there are a lot of methods and processes that came about that say, hey, here is an agile method. And the first is Scrum. And so many people talk, come to agile presentations and talk about Scrum. And they don't talk about anything else. Because Scrum is probably the most widely accepted agile methodology, but is not necessarily the one that, that works, and is not necessarily the only one. But they have become kind of synonymous. So I do want to stress that Agile is not Scrum, and Scrum is not Agile. One is sort of a, a container for the other. So in Scrum, this is a way of doing Agile, implementing those values and those principles with different roles and ceremonies and artifacts and rules and how we limit work. So there's a Scrum master, a product owner, the development team, um, and then we do sprint planning ceremonies, and then we do a daily scrum meeting, a daily stand-up. So, I mean, one of the chief complaints early on was like, we're agile, we do a daily stand-up. Okay, but not really any of the other tenants. Um, and then doing a sprint review or a demo, and then doing retrospectives. So in scrum, the way that they implement uh, that last principle, right, like regular reflections, is to have a ceremony called the retrospective, which is a, a specific meeting where you discuss how did the previous iteration go and what are we gonna do in the future to sort of improve that. And one of the artifacts that, have, or some of the artifacts that come out of that is there is a backlog. So it's the whole list of all the work that needs to be done. That's one way to, to see what needs to happen. And then as you churn through that backlog, you can generate a burn down chart, which is kind of saying if all of these stories or things in the backlog are worth 100 points, we've gotten 20 points done over the last iteration, so we'll need four more iterations in order to kind of complete the project. So velocity and burn down uh, and the increment or the goal for each individual sprint is what comes out of Scrum. Uh, there are rules that are then implemented on top of that. For example, Scrum dictates that you fix bugs from the previous sprint in the very next sprint. It's sort of, it's a pretty rigid rule that it sets um, for Scrum. Uh, no breaks in between sprints, that's not allowed. Um, and all sprints need to be of the same length so that you can decide on a velocity. So that gets also can, can add some complexities when there's Christmas week happens and nobody's working. Um, and the way that Scrum limits work is by never renegotiating the scope of a sprint. So in your sprint planning, you decide we're going to do these nine tasks or stories, and those nine tasks get done in that sprint no matter what. And you know, in my personal experience, that's not how it goes. Um, we're constantly carrying things over from one sprint to the next sprint that we didn't get done. So these are kind of like, well, what do I actually like about Scrum? And I looked at it and said, I love velocity and burn down. Because to be perfectly honest, estimating work is very hard. <laughs> it's very hard to get right. But understanding a pace and interpolating and saying like, well, now that we've done 30% of the tickets, we know that it'll probably take another five weeks, 10 weeks, six months, whatever, to finish this out. So I really like the ideas of velocity and burn down. But sprints, they don't really make sense to me in the way that we work. And we do have one client that we work very successfully in a two week cycle with and have for the last two years. And that works really well because they're just as into it. Um, and that's about it. <laughs> There's a lot of other times when it has really not worked for us. The daily stand-up at my organization just killed us. It killed morale, it killed motivation, it was always a chore, it interrupted people when they were uh, just gotten into doing some really great work, but now I gotta go do my stand-up. So one thing we did with that was we moved the stand-up to be asynchronous and just put it in the we use Mattermost, but our group chat, um, like Slack, saying, put your stand-up in between the hours of 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. Eastern, 
answer the questions of what did you, uh, what are you giving to someone else? What do you need from someone else? And what are you working on today? And that's kind of it. So that we have a quick scannable thing and people can put that in different. Story points also, I really like the idea of story points when you say this story is kind of heavy, this story is kind of light, and being able to get a really good estimate of velocity by knowing how many points we got and how many points are in the total backlog. But nobody else likes them outside of that, especially the developers who need to sit in very long meetings to sort of negotiate how many points belong to a story. They're like, I don't know, but if you let me go work on it, it could be done before this meeting's over, uh, instead of whether we fight over whether or not this is an eight or a 13. So story points, I just, they never really work for us. So you may have heard of Kanban also. This is kind of the second most popular implementation of an agile methodology. I didn't even realize, a lot of my information here is coming from a book by Sam Ryan called like Agile Project Management Methodologies. Very boring title, very thin book. Read it in a night and it, it gave me a lot of good overview about all of the different systems that are kind of out there. So Kanban is one that I always thought, well Kanban is just a way to do work. You put stuff on a list and you kind of move it across its workflow. But actually, Kanban was one of these like fundamental agile methodologies that people were, were using that they brought into that manifesto. And all the ideas there came from the ideas of lean manufacturing. Like, decide as late as possible, right? Which is kind of a really, really in the face of waterfall uh, kind of thing. Like, in Waterfall, you make every decision up front. You make the plan, then you work the plan. Uh, emphasizing the human element is really important in all Agile things. But what you want to do in Kanban is you make this big board. Everything is on the left-hand side of the board to start, and that's your total work that needs to be done. And then you kind of move different tasks through to represent your workflow, whether it's in progress, waiting for code review, waiting for release, uh, you know, and then released or done as you go through. In Kanban, what's really important is to eliminate all waste, optimize and observe the whole, right? It's, it's uh, Kaizen is the other Japanese word that kind of comes along with this Kanban lean manufacturing, which came out of Toyota, I believe, like an actual manufacturing process there. So focusing on eliminating what slows you down, they say gives you a lot more bang for your buck than trying to improve something that's already working okay. So eliminating blockers is prioritized way more than trying to optimize something. The problem with Kanban is it is kind of a everything everywhere all at once kind of approach, so you need the Kanban board in order to see the 30,000 foot view of where is my project at? Because that's what a project manager wants to know. So having the Kanban board is, is like absolutely crucial in Kanban. And the board is what limits the work. So unlike uh, in Scrum where you would say, we're limiting the work over the next two weeks to the stories we've pre-chosen. Instead, we're going to say that the board limits the work, so we will implement rules like a developer can't be working on more than one task at a time, you know? So it's, it's limited to, or some people will say, uh, we can't have more than six in-progress tasks at once. And so you limit the work that way until stuff gets pushed through. So what I really liked about this is like, here is everything that needs to be done. I don't need to do a whole ritual with my team to plan what we're going to do over the next two weeks. We're going to give my, we're going to empower my developers to say, okay, I know what the deadline is for this project, and I know that this is everything that needs to be done. I'm going to pick and move stuff as it occurs to me, the developer. So I really like the, the way that Everyone can always see, because of the board, the status of the project as a whole, but developers can also um, self-select, right? We can empower people to do what needs to be done to get the project done, and that really works well for our team. 
But there's not really an analog to velocity. We don't we don't put points on the stories, and you know maybe they're not even stories in Kanban. They're just tasks that need to be done. So there's no direct analog to velocity, and not a good thing, not a bad thing, but with so much reliance on the board, the board must be accurate. So if you think, for example, on your team that you're not gonna be able to keep your Kanban board up to date, then this is not necessarily a system that's going to work for you. So extreme programming is another system that came out of Agile. And to me, until sort of reading more about it, extreme programming to me was just pair programming. I didn't know that there was anything else to it. But extreme programming is a methodology design, uh, define the life cycle of how we're going to approach work, which is we code it, we test it, we listen for feedback, and then we go back and we redesign. So it, maybe designing is actually first in that cycle, but it's a loop, so that's what really matters. You think about what you're gonna build, you build it, you test it, then you get user feedback and you iterate again. Right? Agile is all about that sort of constant iteration. And the five principles that were defined related to extreme programming are communication, simplicity, feedback, courage, and respect. So those last two are really interesting, right? Because this actually really brings home that point that Agile is about people and not actually processes. Um, that said, the, the real issue is like people need processes to follow to be successful, but courage and respect, um, it's a lot about be, being able to speak up inside of your team. That's very important. So they do have other rituals and core tenets here in extreme programming. They have a planning game, which is kind of like planning poker if you've ever done that in Scrum, or um, it's a way to figure out what are we going to do next. And we're gonna plan for small releases so that we're constantly iterating and delivering working software. We're gonna have customer acceptance tests, simplicity, paired programming. They leaned hard into test-driven development, which is where you write the test, you write a failing test first, and then you write the code. Um, code ownership is another one to just bring up. Um, that in extreme programming, the whole team owns all the code, owns the entire thing. There are some other methodologies where that gets really flipped on its head. Coding standards, sustainable pace, and the metaphor. So let me talk about sustainable pace first. Extreme programming actually has a lot of criticisms for increasing the pace to a level that's not sustainable, that it is so good at being agile and adaptive that it burns developers out. So actually something that's very interesting about XP. And then the metaphor, which is really it's a core tenet of extreme programming to be able to explain what your software is doing through the use of a metaphor. And we frequently, when we're building websites, we frequently talk about building a house. That's the metaphor that we use. So we say, hey, you're not gonna hear much from the developers initially because we're just doing all the framing. You know, it's not gonna look much like a house yet because it's only going to be framing and insulation. It won't really start to look like a house until we can actually paint the walls and paint the outside and put a real roof on it. So that is a good way to talk to clients about how to, we're doing a bunch of site building. We're not really gonna be doing theming until later on in the process. So you're not gonna see anything at this first demo that's like very useful to you. Um, but being able to explain it with a metaphor is very helpful. So, I don't like pair programming, and I don't, I say I, but at least my company, we don't like pair programming because for the most part, our project team is usually about two people. And they say pair programming can really give you more than double the efficiency, but I don't necessarily believe that's true. And probably if we were writing nothing but like object-oriented Java classes, that might be true, but I need Jessica and Jay to both be building two different content types at the same time, and they don't need to be over each other's shoulders to do that. Where we do use pair programming is on something like, I've got a hard problem, or I don't know if I should approach it with this module or this one, 
and we'll try it together. And doing mentorship for juniors with a senior, obviously that stuff is, is very useful. So I did add deep up sometimes. But I really like the metaphor. It's very helpful to us, like I said. This one I thought is very interesting. That the customer is always defining the requirements for your tests. So if you've ever done any testing with anything like BHAT, the whole idea of that like gherkin language in BHAT is so that uh, business folks, non-technical folks, can write the test requirements. You're saying, well, you know, as a uh, you know authenticated user, I can see this pass this uh, content, but if, as an anonymous user, I can't. Right? It's up to the client, in our case, the client or the customer, to say what the test requirements are, and then we write the tests. And that I could see we've not done this or tried this, but I can see that being very useful to get the community buy-in. You know, there's a lot of times when customers and developers are kind of like, you didn't do this and you didn't test it. And it's like, it would be really nice to say, we did test it and we tested it per, per your requirements and it passed. So the issue is that we need different test requirements, but those come from you. Um, and, and again, I don't see it being adversarial. I see it actually lightening some of that adversarialness. But the customer always being involved in the planning game. So when they do the planning game, when we would do Scrum, it was like the developers would sit down and decide on what the next tasks are that we're going to do. Because even Scrum would dictate that the product owner should be in the planning. So, and that's usually, hopefully, someone on the client side. But they, what we found is that our customers don't care. <laughs> like, they don't care if we do this before that. They just care that it's all done by May 1 or whatever it is. So I, I, that, that, that doesn't really work for us being able to, to move over there. So then there was a whole bunch of things that came up called the crystal methods. And there's actually a bunch of different flavors of these. So there's like um, crystal blue, crystal red, crystal orange, crystal clear. And crystal is like, gets a lot of flack because it's so not prescriptive. <laughs> there's like, like I think the reason people really latched onto Scrum and it ended up becoming synonymous with Agile is because it is the most prescriptive. Here are the ceremonies. Here's how you do Scrum. First Monday, you do a planning meeting. Last Friday, two weeks later, you do a retrospective. And it's very prescriptive. Crystal is like incredibly not prescriptive. And, and, and yet there are a lot of books on uh, the different Crystal methods. So there is uh, Crystal Orange Web is actually a book in one of the crystal methods is specific to web projects. And then Crystal Clear is for small teams. So a lot of this crystal stuff came out of, uh, I don't know if it was IBM, but it was definitely like a very large um, tech organization. So yeah, what I, I want like there to be like a Crystal Clear Web. That's kind of what I really want to land on. But Really, there, there's a lot of roles, and they kind of say, like, here's a bunch of roles that might make sense in this. Depends on your project. Um, the one thing it serves to do is delineate methodology from technique and from policy. So a lot of times, people glom all of these together and say, like, this is how we do it because we're doing crystal, when in fact it's actually just a company policy that you do it that way. So that was its main focus and to distill it down to what are the actual properties that we care about. And so with Crystal, again, it's not super prescriptive. It doesn't necessarily tell you how to do frequent delivery, just that you need to. It doesn't tell you how to do reflective improvement, but it offers some suggestions of some ways. So in a lot of ways, Crystal is, is another agile meta framework almost, and not, not a process. But I do love a lot of these shared properties um, you know, we do want to do frequent delivery. We do want to do reflective improvement. I love this one. So this is probably, they've described what osmotic communication kind of is and means. And this was a big influencer into that agile principle of face-to-face -face communication. And I was just talking to Tim Doyle about this in the lunch line. Um, 
in the world of remote work, you know, he comes from a very face-to-face -face background, and working at the association with an entirely remote workforce has been a bit of a challenge. And I thought of the same thing. This osmotic communication happens when people are in the same room. So if developer A is talking to developer B about something, the third person's over here and kind of half listening to it and hearing it, and maybe jumping in with an idea. Oh, you know what, I actually had to solve that problem two weeks ago for a different client. Or just knowing that they're working on something that involves paragraphs. That kind of osmotic communication is gone, in my estimation, from distributed teams. Unless you default to open and you're always talking about everything in like the general channel, which I honestly would advocate for, but a lot of people are like, there is so much to read there that is not of value to me. And I would argue that point, whether or not it's valuable to them or not. But osmotic communication is a really tricky one. And personal safety is another one that I think is amazing in Crystal, which is like, they will say you're not doing Crystal unless every person on your team feels comfortable speaking up when they think something is going wrong. And that's a really important concept to, to bring through. Uh, focus is like developers need to be able to focus. Easy access to expert users is fundamental to Crystal. So how do you get access to an actual end user of your software who is kind of a power user of that software? And then it needs to have a good technical environment that supports continuous delivery. So, you know, I said we don't really like that it's not very prescriptive because it's, it's not necessarily giving me ideas of things to do, but it is telling me what kinds of things should be happening. Like, we are good, we're doing good if we have osmotic communication, but it doesn't really tell me how to get that osmotic communication. Uh, that focus element that I thought was really cool is that developers must be protected, their time and their focus must be protected, and that it's the PM's job to do that protecting, to sort of stand in front and uh, run run interference for developers so that they don't get distracted. And then, you know, not a like, not a dislike, but a big component of Crystal and being successful is do you have that emotional safety for the people on your team? So feature-driven development came along. I'm going to start moving through this a little bit quicker, especially because these are much less well-known. Feature development, feature-driven development came along and defined the whole cycle in terms of features. So we tried this for a while and my team hated it. <laughs> um, but the idea was, how do you go and approach building a big website? Do you build all the content types and then theme all the content types and then sort of build out any custom functionality and then deliver it? Or do you deliver the things that you sort of said you would deliver in your statement of work um, we are going to have a news feature. We are going to have a blog feature. We are going to have basic pages. And we actually started developing a feature at a time. And we said, our current iteration is we're working on news. So we would build news, theme news, build all the views that were related to news, build everything that related to news, and deliver it fully functional. But the rest of the site couldn't do anything. Right? We just built it a feature at a time. So the, one of the requirements in feature-driven development is that hard code ownership. So this works really well because this is born and bred out of object-oriented development. So they actually say, like, whoever wrote this class is the owner of this class, and nobody else can do anything to it without their permission. And it's very rigid in terms of code ownership, which is really powerful when you um, know you need something and you can just approach Joey because Joey's in charge of the you know the, the payment processor whatever um, and they have a few other things that we've seen now a bunch of times you gotta have config management you gotta have CI um, they dictate that you have to have visibility of progress and results but they don't say how but it might be on a big board a Kanban board it might be in some other tool it might even be just like weekly status reports that the PM generates and sends to the client, but there does need to be some visibility there. And they do they do lean into a two week, like if a feature would take more than two weeks to develop, it's too big and you need to have a smaller feature. Um, 
but a lot in Agile says that like the thing should be functional. It should be fully functional by the time we deliver it. And when building Drupal sites, that's not necessarily something that makes a ton of sense because being able to enter news is fully functional if just the content type is built. But is the news feature complete if it's not every view of news on the site is built and themed and ready? I don't know. What I really like about it, though, is it speaks to how our clients think about things. So when they come in and say, um, you know, here are the things we need in a website. We need a news feature, a blog feature, an FAQ feature, whatever it is. We can say, FAQs are done, and that's a language we can talk together. It's very hard to talk to a client a lot of times about like, well, we've built out some content types. And they're like, okay. Uh, and then, um, I, even so, what I said that what we were doing is going back to this cycle of like, you do a high level scope, then you build a feature list, which is like kind of the backlog of everything. Then you plan by feature, design by feature, and build by feature. It's actually unclear to me whether you plan all features, but just do it a feature at a time, then you move on to design each feature, and then you build. Or if you pick a feature, plan it, design it, build it. Pick a new feature, plan it, design it, build it. So, a little bit unsure of that, but, but doing it by feature was, was helpful in speaking to clients about saying like, you remember this part of our SOW, or we're gonna build news or blog, that's done. And it does get us thinking about releases with Agile. So this one is one of the most useful things that I think came out of it. So Agile actually was, the predecessor to it was RAD, Rapid Application Development, and DSVM was kind of like, doing Agile as an extension of RAD without making people let go of the things they like about Waterfall. If we remember our early principle of um, working software over documentation, overwriting documentation, I, does anyone have a client who's like, no, I don't want any documentation. I don't need to know how it works. Like, I don't want to use it. Like, that's wild to me. Like, people need documentation. So, um, DSDM was kind of, it came about to kind of bridge the gap between old school and new school in a way that I think really works uh, really well in agencies and, and when building websites. So it still supports documentation, especially in terms of, of Moscow, so determining requirements using Moscow. And it sets out the time, cost, and quality at the outset of the project. And this is something that like, we feel like we have to do, right? Because we are trying to sell something to a client. We're trying to sell them a website. So we need to define, well, what is your budget for the website? When do you need it live by? And what should it do? So that's the classic three-legged stool. And a lot of times they say, uh, do you want it fast, good, or cheap? Pick two, right? You can't pick all three. It can be fast and good, but not cheap, you know? You can have it good and cheap, but it's gonna take a long time to get there because, you know, put a junior developer on it or whatever it is. So um, with Agile, that's like out the window because Agile came about in organizations where they were dealing with internal budgets and internal timelines and things that were like more flexible, right? When you do an engagement with a client, you kind of know what the budget is and so with DSDM, you can do Agile while still setting out the time, cost, and quality at the outset of the project. And then we need to define, well, what are we building? You know, in real Agile, you might not, you might not know what you're building until you plan the two-week sprint. It's so like, all right, well, I guess if we're going to build this website, we need news. So let's go ahead and build that out. And, and that really doesn't work. So Moscow is... If you've ever seen older technical requirements documentation, um, the M is must, should, could, and won't. And that is a way that I, we have not tried yet, but I think would really speak to clients in terms of understanding prioritization of things. Like, we've, we've used a lot of language around like that's a nice to have or that's, but I think being able to say must, should, could, and won't is a really good way for everyone to get on the same page about what we're building. 
and then there's there's eight principles all associated with DSDM. Um, you know, you've got to deliver iteratively, you've got to communicate. A lot of these same principles that we've seen over and over. DSDM has some good techniques. Um, time boxing is an important one, and this this works well with with agencies. And my mind is like, well, let's just assume the time and the budget is always fixed because. If you're billing by the hour, you know you're going to go over if you spend too many hours. So we know that we are going to spend this amount of time on this budget, and the variable is features. The, usually with a client, though, the variable isn't let's drop the entire news thing. They usually don't want to do that. But there is usually some compromises we can make that are uh, simplify things. So must, could, should, and won't. And then they have a lot of still the agile iterative cycle of building a prototype, testing it, doing workshops, modeling it again, and sort of cycling through that. And of course, config management, which gets mentioned all over the place. There are some different roles, but there's these are just some of them. There are a lot of possible roles, but again, not as prescriptive as Scrum, where it's like, you're this, that, or the other thing. So there's the project champion, the, the visionary, maybe an ambassador, a PM. The PM's job is to remove obstacles from a skilled team. Senior management must be on board, and there must be supportive relationships between everyone. And then the cycle it goes through is a feasibility study, then a discovery, or a business study where you create the requirements. Then you build a functional prototype, then you build a designed prototype, and then you actually implement it. So this phasing is, this feels like a lot. So when we talk about that, I really like that formal documentation is okay in DSDM. We can do documents, we can do a specification of what this website will do and won't do. I think, again, Moscow is more understandable than having a client jump in every two weeks and groom the backlog to push important items up to the top. Um, by deciding this at the outset, the developers can pull what they know to be the most important things. It still releases incrementally, but it has an end goal in mind from the outset. So because we're setting up that stool at the beginning, we know what we're doing. Only features are flexible, that jives. That usually is how it is. Like when we do a negotiation with someone, we know the timeline and the budget. So. But the phases is way too drawn out for a website. Like I'm not going to build a functional prototype of my website and then do a designed prototype and then actually build it. I think that that's a little bit, a little bit much. And then I would be remiss if I did not mention Consultancy Scrum, which actually Four Kitchens came up with. I remember going to a presentation on this at a DrupalCon like a decade ago, which is kind of like they recognize the environment that birthed Agile was like, you're inside of Toyota, you're inside of IBM, and you're building a product for that company. But in consultancies and in agencies, that doesn't work. You're, you're basically spending other people's money, right? And so you can't just do whatever you want to get that thing out the door at, it, at it, any given time. So it takes the inward-facing nature and turns it inside out. And there's like five core tenets of consultancy scrum, which is that a project is different than a product, acknowledging that. The client should provide the project owner role. It always assumes the budget is inflexible. So whereas DSDM assumes the budget and the timeline are inflexible. But then consultancy scrum recognizes the need for like an external liaison to manage the client relationship, right? Because you're working as a team together, your client folks and you, and you're working together, and it's easy to sort of forget that there is a business relationship here as well. And so having someone that outside of the product team to manage like, hey, I've got a problem that I think, you know, your developer, if a client says your developers are, should be getting things done faster, or they keep throwing out my ideas or whatever it is, it's very nice for the client to have someone external to the team inside the, um, consultancy to have those kinds of conversations with. And the last tenet of it is that it should itself be adaptable, which is kind of the, the whole idea here. Everything of Agile is like, it should be as adaptable as possible. So our journey was basically like, all right, well, Agile means Scrum, so we'll do Scrum. That's where we started. <laughs> like, okay, well, no, we've got to do this every two weeks. And, you know, we did a lot of fighting with ourselves about this not working. 
and it just being that we don't know what we're doing and it's our fault. So then we got so fed up with it, we said maybe we just need to just do waterfall. You know, we're like let's let's just write a big fat requirements document and then let's go away and then let's have a change order process to uh, sign up with like, okay, I acknowledge that this is a change from our spec and it's gonna cost me $1,500 and I've gotta go through all of that paperwork to get something done. And that sucks too. Like, it's just a step backwards when the pendulum swings that way. And then it was kind of like, oh look, <coughs> there's stuff out there that is different. There is Agile that is not Scrum. So our project life cycle is a lot more of we are going to do a formal discovery. We're going to talk about your audience, your goals, your personas, your user stories, and that feels a little waterfally. But it, and then that informs our web spec. So our web spec is kind of our Moscow document. It defines what we think this website is going to do. Then we move on to design, and this is where a lot of these other Agile methodologies would talk about doing a prototype, maybe a functional or a design prototype. So in our design phase, we do wireframes and interactivity first, but then we move on to the visual design aspect. Then we get into the development cycle, which is really the, the hard and heavy one. How am I doing on time? Am I way over 2.42? And then we move into QA and testing after that. So I know that a lot of Agile is like test-driven development, test-driven development. You've got to write the test first. And we don't. We just don't do that. We write the tests after the development phase. And I'll talk about that in a bit. So our method is really largely Kanban. That's where we've landed after all of this because, like I said, our clients don't care about prioritizing things because they just want it all done by the project end date. And they're not informed enough to say like, yeah, you should do this task before that other task. It's developers who really know what those uh, blockers are and dependencies, and Kanban lets the developers intuitively understand, oh, I know I need to build this view because I can't uh, you know, build the news page until I've built the news view. Right? And then inside of the development phase, we do a build, and then a theme, and then an extra. So we've finally landed on we're going to build out all of our taxonomies, all of our content types, all of our entities, um, whatever we need. We're going to do all that first. Then we're going to move into like a theming and front end phase. And then we're going to move into any extra bonus features, custom modules, uh, tricky configuration things like implementing workflows. We're going to do all that like um, really sort of custom stuff at the end. And then one big thing for us is we've really decided that the backlog that developers are working from need to be tasks, not stories. So in Scrum, the backlog is made up of stories, but that's not prescriptive enough to a, uh, like a junior developer. If you say a story like, as a content admin, I want to approve drafts so that we don't publish um, you know, bad content. A developer can't look at that and intuit what they need to do. So we need to break that down into tasks, which is like implement the workflow module. Here are the four states of the workflow module. And all of that has already been documented in the web spec for us, and they build from that. So for introspection, we do a weekly check-in with the project team, and that serves as a stand-up and a retro for us. So we talk about what are your blockers, you know, coming out of last week that the PM needs to help you with, anything we need to do better, and that lasts about 30 minutes. And that works a lot better than doing a daily stand-up because just our developers don't have enough to say every day. Like, still working on that news build. Thanks, Eddie. I, <laughs> not, not helpful. Whereas, what'd you do last week? That's a, that's a good enough increment that they're like, I worked on the search feature and I got stopped up because we need an open solar implementation, um, but I did get the editorial workflows done. Great, that's, a, that's the, the cycle that fits for us. So then our increments and what we're delivering to the client, we have relaxed out of two weeks because there's just nothing. There's not a lot, especially early on in a project that we can show a client after two weeks that, that, that they're excited for, right? So we go and we say this month we're gonna be building a lot of stuff. 
and then we do a demo where we show them all the different types of content that they can create and enter and how the relationships are and they see that we've done stuff. Then we theme it and we come back in say another month or six weeks or whatever it takes and, and they come back and they start to see like, ooh, this is a really good, like I can actually see the design come to life here and I can see the pieces that you've built now working. So now I create a news entry and then I can show them the news view and it looks pretty and they're like, wow, you guys are building a website here. And then maybe in the third month or whatever it happens to be, we say, now you remember how you were building all these news items? Well now, when someone creates news, here, you're getting your workflow notifications now, you're getting the email, here's how you could click here to go and moderate and review the, the uh, news item and publish it, whatever it is you need to do. But then for velocity, which I really like, as a PM, whether I know that there's a fixed timeline and a fixed budget, I still need to know if we are going to hit it. But without story points, how do I know what I'm going to, like, are we gonna hit it? I don't know. And here's what I figured out. Story points don't effing matter. <laughs> they all come out in the wash. So if you have 212 tasks to, that takes this project from point A to point B, and you've done 50 of them, you're about 25% of the way there, <laughs> right? Whether you did a bunch of, thir like, yes, I suppose it's possible that you do all the 13s later, and you do the, all the twos at the beginning, and maybe that messes you up, but we haven't found that that matters enough. <laughs> so I thought that was a pretty interesting thing. And then we actually delay the formal QA and testing, which is like, ooh, Agile people might give me a big slap for that. But we do that to dovetail with when the client's actually ready to start doing content entry on the site, because that's how they're gonna test it anyway. You can't, you know, you're supposed to, at the demo, the client is supposed to be accepting this iteration and saying it's done, and you're filing all of your issues into the next sprint or whatever. And that doesn't really work. Until a client puts their hands on it, they don't know if it works or doesn't work. They're just taking your word for it. So we let them QA while they're entering content, and that's when we go back and start writing actual like regression tests for a lot of our stuff. So we say, okay, I've built the workflow. I was testing it as I built it. I know it works. Now I want to write an automated test so that when our support team six months from now needs to change the workflow, that they know that we didn't like break all the notifications. So, so I want to point out Drupal test traits is amazing for this. If anyone hasn't, if, if you're writing tests and you want to be able to write regression tests against your actual site, Drupal test traits is awesome. And we only are testing code we write or configuration that we make, anything that's custom. Just be sure when you're testing, you don't need to test whether Drupal saved a node. Drupal has plenty of tests that, to prove that it can save a node. We also really love the metaphor and really love that three-legged stool. Um, at, at a minimum, budget is inflexible, but we usually do this kind of from consultancy scrum. Let the client say which one is more important after budget. Is it meeting your time or having all the things done that you want to have done so that we can let them that helps the client solidify in their brain, okay, I've already said time is most important. I want to have this website launched before the conference happens. So with that in mind, I know that we can launch this at the conference if it didn't have X feature. It helps them uh, do it. So the main point is really there's different ways of doing this Agile thing, and some of them might even work. And the reminder is that Agile wants you to do it in a way that makes sense for your team, right? people over process. If you can empower the right people, you will get it done. And that's what we found, is by listening to my team and listening to them say, I hate this stand-up, and actually allowing myself to say, okay, that doesn't work for us, instead of trying to force something onto them, I have let Agile emerge out of my team and my people and let them tell me what works and doesn't work. And so even it was even very recently where we said, I'm throwing this out, I'm putting every one of these tasks on Kanban board, and you guys decide what you're gonna work on. And all I told them was on January 30th, I'm demo I'm doing a demo, on February I'm doing a demo, and at the end of March I'm doing a demo. I told them we're gonna mostly build, then it'll look good, then we'll do all the complex stuff. 
and my developers have just pulled the right things off the list for me to hit that demo every single time. So that's stuff that has worked for us. It looks like I'm definitely not going to get into that big discussion-y, workshop -y part of it, but I would absolutely welcome any and all discussion, questions. I'd love to hear any of your all's thoughts and what has worked and not worked for you. Feel free if you would like. While I'm here packing up, I'm happy to answer. Let me do like the top level for the project build up overall management. We are using um, the tool we're using is called Hive and Hive. Yep. And it basically it just is very generic. It's not very different from like Trello boards where you just kind of have you can make an infinite number of lists to represent your sort of Kanban board, and then. Um, Hive is able to give me quickly like how many tickets of this total backlog have been closed, right? So I can easily kind of calculate velocity at any given point. And say, here's how much we are through the budget. Here's how many tickets we create. Now we're 37 percent of the way through the project. We're 42 percent of the way through the budget. Not too concerned yet, but I can easily kind of do those check-ins to see what happens. about your structure. Did you say that you're two people? No. Our development team right now is is two plus me. So um, the sites we built are are largely around a two person team. The company has ten people, but we have you know we have an admin, we have you know sales, and then we have um, we have a support side of the organization that is three and a half people, and they're doing ongoing support in a in in a much different kind of way. Than this. But the project side of the house where it's like we need a new website or we need an upgrade, something substantial. It's about two developers plus me. We're all wearing a lot of hats. So my both my developers can do site building. Both my developers can do front end. One's better than the other. One is trying to learn more back end. The other is really the back end specialist. And then I play the kind of PM, technical lead architect hat and do some you know, real heavy dev. If, like if my more senior guy gets in trouble or something, then I'll step in. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.